Ah. Oh, hi, Gilbert. I will stop share uh, at 11 o'clock. Is it okay? St stop share the, uh, that the, uh, now the screen share. I will stop the screen share. Okay. So, yeah, uh, 11. that's fine. Okay. Thank you. I'm almost ready. I just trying to do a couple of things. Okay. Oh, hold on. Okay, I'm ready to go. Are we close to the time? And Gilbert, you would like uh, people to turn on the video? Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay, good. I can hear you, so that works well. So it's a little early for people on the West Coast, but it's right before lunch for you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. On with that. Sorry, I just have to connect everything. But I, I was looking at it, and I thought I had like an extra hour, and I went, wait a second, I'm starting in 20 minutes. <laughs> so no problem. Good. So we'll get started. Um, thank you everyone for joining us at the Sunday Dharma Talk hosted by CMC. And today it's our pleasure to have Gilbert back to give us three consecutive lectures again in September. Um, for those who don't know Gilbert yet, um, he has um, over 39 years of meditation experience, which includes his study of various martial arts as well as Qigong. In 2002, Gilbert received Dharma transmission from uh, Master Shen Yan Shifu. Make, um, and then he currently conducts retreats and lectures throughout North America, um, previously in Taiwan too, before COVID. Uh, his home base is in South, uh, Southern California and he lectures regularly at the LA DDMBA chapter and with his own Riverside Chan meditation group in California. Gilbert teaches in a classical Chan style, which inspires his students to investigate Chan through diligent practice. So um, today's talk is um, meditation from the basics to advanced practices. And that's, um, well, hand it back to Gilbert. And first we'll recite uh, four great vows. Please join pound. Bow. I vow to deliver innumerable sentient beings. I vow to cut off endless fixations. I vow to master limitless approaches to Dharma. I vow to attain Supreme Buddhahood. Okay. Okay, good morning uh, to you all. Um, you're in the right place if you want to learn about uh, meditation, uh, whether you're a beginner or an advanced practitioner, um, or went back to being a beginner again after being an advanced practitioner. Um, I dedicate this uh, lecture to um, Venerable Master Shen Ying, who enabled me to remove the cataracts from my eyes. Um, this is a lecture series as to how to meditate, um, but it's not gonna be by the numbers um, in terms of we start and I tell you this posture and you hold this posture and you sit there. Um, if 
if you're used to kind of a direct linear PowerPoint presentation, this is not going to be it. This is going to go right straight to the heart of what we do when we meditate. And who is meditating? It's a good question. Why do we meditate is another good question. Um, and ultimately, what is meditation? Um, the approach to this is um, using the right view to, uh, to practice with and to begin to understand meditation. Right view, in case of, there are some of you that, that aren't familiar with that term, is one that Master Shen Yang indicated that his Dharma heirs had to possess in order to become a Dharma heir. And the right view is, is seeing things exactly as they are via the mind's own perception, uh, not the perception from consciousness, which is, uh, a, a, we could say, a false consciousness. And it is just this mind. And it, when we practice meditation with right view, it changes everything. It completely changes the playing field. It changes the direction in which one is, is meditating. Um, and you'll see that as we, we go along. Um, I'm not going to teach you how to meditate. What I hope to do in these three sessions is how to see. You need to kind of think about that, what I'm talking about, how to see. We say, well, I use my eyes all the time and I see here and I see there. And, but is that really seeing? Are, are you seeing things as they are? Are you seeing them through these kind of rose colored glasses or dark glasses um, that are there due to uh, the obscurations in the, in the consciousness? And then you believe that to be real. You believe it to be that's the way that you should see. But imagine if you were like a person of limited sight and a doctor was able to show you or give you some kind of a treatment that enabled you to see, clearly see. Before that treatment, you would not have an idea of what is sight. You would think, well, how can he make me see better? I see objects or whatever. But in um, snap of the fingers, everything can come into crystal clear, uh, clarity, including that which believes that it was seen before. These are the cataracts that meditation and right view practice remove. And then you know, you know, this is seen, even if it's for such a short moment in that snap of the fingers. You saw, not the you that you think, but you know what this you is, that this is mine, looking at, into mine. So you can see from the very beginning, we're already outside the uh, uh, navigable waters that you've been using in terms of meditation and, and practice. We're now turning the boat around to look and go, okay, let's see what's on the boat. So this is where we start. Um, I guess all of you have already uh, known to meditate in some way and some do it better than others. Some struggle trying to stop the images in their head some dream, some create fanciful images and burst of colors. And few start correctly. This is a lecture series that will explore meditation. It will be useful 
uh, to all, whether one is a novice or an expert. We uh, will explore meditation from all aspects, from practice methods, theory and doctrine, experiences that you have in meditation, so-called stages that one can run into, and the history uh, of uh, uh, Chan Buddhism as it applies uh, to meditation. Now, that's an awful lot. And, but the big issue is then where, where do we start? Um, well, we start in this moment. This moment. this moment. Well, this is a start. You see how everything changes when we put the mind in the present moment. So now we come to, if we're going to have a talk about meditation, what is meditation? How could you define meditation? Any of you out there want to venture for it? I mean, you have an interest in this. Anybody want to say what meditation is? Definition of it. No John trick, just simple. If you want to learn to practice meditation first, you have to know what it is. No one. There's so many sagacious people out there. I see a lot of names that have 20, 30, 40 years of experience or more. Nobody venture for it. Okay. Formal meditation can be defined as a controlled sitting experience in a controlled environment devoid of most distractions. So in, when we do sitting meditation, we want to be in a controlled environment. We don't want to have phones go, going off, the television in the background, um, people coming in and asking you questions. Um, you want as a, a quiet environment as you can get um, so that you're not distracted. Now, this environment you realize is not really reality, right? I mean, how often do you have a chance to shut everything out? To, um, not very often during the day, if you say, I will go to meditate, and if you can do that, that's great. But during your day, it's not that way. You were bombarded with various um, mind activities at the sensory gates. Um, you were moving, driving in a car, talking to people at work, uh, preparing food, cleaning up, resting. So with all of these, it's difficult for you to have a, um, a, a, a meaningful practice. So when we sit to meditate, we, we dedicate this time for us to, um, to sit and um, to, to practice properly. When we sit, then it allows us to uh, wean ourselves from mental activities. We still have all of the mental activities that are coming through the window. Apologize for that. Uh, 
um, we still get uh, information coming in, but we use our practice to be able to manage that. This is uh, a quiet zone. If you ask me, you know, when do I meditate? Actually, I never stop meditating. Meditation is simply coming into touch with mind itself. When Gilbert or the sense of the ego or personality uh, arises, then meditation is stopped. But this kind of practice comes about from first practicing in a quiet area to enable us to, to settle down the mind, to begin to use the natural discernment of the mind to see things that are arising um, in it. This is very important. We will talk about that uh, in, in more detail later on. When we sit to meditate, we take a posture. And uh, I don't think there's anybody who's listening that doesn't know a meditation posture. We take that posture because it gives us the physical stability to not fall over when we're meditating or to lean to this side or to lean to the other side. It is just simply a place that we park the body. Now understand a lot of you believe if you cross your legs and you put your hands this way, that's meditation. If that was um, the case here in Southern California, all the cars that are in the, um, in the shopping center that are parked would have become enlightened a long time ago. They can turn on their, their headlights, but it's not enlightenment. But this is the way we sit. We sit thinking that if we cross our legs and sit in this way, we can, uh, we can uh, this is meditation practice. But it's not, it's, it's a precursor to it. And it's better than not sitting. But I really want you to go deeper into the practice into something that will produce a positive uh, result. And um, if you're only receiving the uh, this kind of basic instruction and then sending you off to meditate with the admonition, don't think, this is very, very sad. Um, meditation for many years has been taught this way in different places. I know of a center that that's all they did was with beginners is this basic instruction, cross your legs, sit in this posture, don't think. And as a result of it, there were few, if any, of the people within that group that had any kind of a significant breakthrough simply because they were just parking their body. I don't mean to be critical about others. I just want to enhance and make sure that you understand how to meditate, how it makes a difference. So let's go back. What is meditation? What do we do when we meditate? And then you all start hanging your heads and not looking at the screen saying, I can see you. What is meditation? What do we do? When we meditate, we are doing it in the wrong way. When we meditate, we meditate from the idea of the consciousness. I am meditating and I am seeing this. I am seeing the method and you hold the method, and then you see these thoughts coming in from the periphery of your concentration, and then get bedazzled by it. Oh, look, 
that's something that I want to see. And so you start looking at it, a very bright light or whatever it is, or a thought of some problem, and you're off meditation. Of course, you're going to be because the manner in which you're using it is consciousness trying to meditate on consciousness. It won't work that way. When we meditate, we, we use our mind to look at the method that superimpose on mine. The way we do it is we have We have someone meditating, looking at the method. And this is what we believe to be meditation. We completely miss the matching have, which is the knowing aspect of mind. And this knowing aspect of mind should be seen simply the method in this way. There is no seer of the method. There's the knower of the method, which is mind itself. We do not need to have Gilbert is meditating. When the method arises, the method is the only thing that one should concentrate on when they're meditating, just the method. Now, as you're meditating on the method, there's gonna be a veritable potpourri of different things that arise in, in mind. There could be um, money, house, people that arise, all coming in, vying for attention with the method. I don't think there's any one of you that hasn't had, when you sat to meditate, that you could sit and all your thoughts would go away. It doesn't work that way. What happens is, is that... Um, you, you sit and you watch the method for a little bit of time. And then these other things distract you. They take you away from, from the method. Because when you're sitting there, you're sitting there as a person looking at the method. You already have the habitual tendency that you have to be there. But you are an imagining of mine. So if you were there, or if you arise, then and you're there meditating, you, you appear just like something else that's arising in mind the top one being somebody meditating. And, and that is the consciousness. That is the idea that there is somebody that's meditating, watching the method. So it's, um, sorry, I'm getting it from the window. Give me one second. I'll remember that for next time. I apologize. I think I made it worse. Um, Good. 
get rid of it. Yeah. It's better. Better? Yeah, better enough. Okay, sorry about that. As you can see, I'm on the southern side and as I'm doing it, the sun is tracking and getting worse and worse. So I knew it, I knew I had to deal with something. So hopefully it'll take care of it. Okay. We're back. Um When we meditate, just use mind to see the method in the present moment. This is how we practice. We should not make this double bologna sandwich in which there's the method and then Gilbert is watching the method and then mind is watching Gilbert watch the method. We don't need Gilbert to be there to be a distraction or an obstruction. Because when we put Gilbert in there, Gilbert invites all the other vexations and discriminations, um, desires, uh, aversions to come with him. So he's adding more than what is necessary to be there. But if we set him aside and then just let mind look, then now you're really doing meditation. So that's very, very important. We give ourselves the best practice field to work within we could say that wherever we practice in our house is our own Chan Hall. So you try to make it the best place that you can be. You find a quiet place that um, hopefully people won't disturb you. I'm going to go meditate for, for um, you know, 30 minutes, an hour. Please don't disturb me. No, uh, that kind of thing. Somewhere where you know you're going to be quiet and you make it with the least distractions possible. So you wouldn't wanna put like a Buddha statue on top of a TV, you know, because then you'd start thinking about what's on TV. You wanna have some kind of a place where, where there's the least distractions as if you're facing a wall and that would be good. Something that's not moving, you don't meditate outside uh, looking through a window, for instance, you're just simply in a place where the um, hopefully you can get a comfortable temperature, but that's not as important as just any kind of other distractions or movements in, in the room. So this isolation is a key um, for the practice field. So when you practice, you want to eliminate all these things so that you give yourself a chance to be able to put down the self that says it's too hot, too cold, too loud, too light, too dark, um, whatever, there's too many things. And um, so when you do that, then you have a good chance to have an experience. At least the environment will not affect you uh, as much. Later on, the environment has no effect on you whatsoever other than uh, fulfilling your vows, but that's a little bit further down the road and we'll talk about that. Um, and, and I keep asking you because I want you to, to think about this is what is meditation? What is it? No, what, what am I doing? Or am I doing anything or is mine just simply resting? And when we look at things and we say we're practicing for the mind to avoid vexatious thoughts uh, from affecting the mind environment, this is a way we can um, uh, define meditation, but what is this mind 
environment. If we're practicing to avoid these vexatious thoughts or clinging to them in the mind environment, then what is this mind environment that I'm talking about? Anybody have an idea? Does this thing work? I think I've disconnected to you guys because I don't see anybody answering my questions. So, yes, and Angela, no? So what is the mind environment? Anybody? I'll give you a hint, you can't miss. Uh, now the participant can unmute themselves. Okay. Could you say that again a little louder, please? Uh, now the participants can unmute themselves. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Now we can, but before we cannot. So Gilbert, that's why when you ask questions, nobody can answer you because we can't really turn on the mic. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry about <laughs> so that. Bad. Sorry. All right, understood. We'll, we'll remember that for next time. So does anybody know what the mind environment is? Here's your chance. You better unmute them again. Uh, so Ching Ching, uh, raise yes. your hand. Yes, Ching Ching. I, 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 I don't think I can answer this question, so I'm sorry. I was trying to tell you that we cannot unmute ourselves. That's all. I, that's why I raised my hand, because I know that without raising the hand, nobody will notice this. But no problem. Th thank question. you very much. Okay, Miranda so from I Vancouver. Want, I'm, no. I want to speak on mind. Mind is a storage about the past, future, future and the present. It's all the information inside the mind. Uh, we do the meditation, we just clear out. Or not clear out, or you have ability to empty it. That's what we try to have this ability. Or I don't know, just the basic one. Thank you. Yeah, it's very interesting. I, I think there's some parts there that would fit very well. And I, I'm hoping to cover it in this lecture. And that will help you kind of fit this all together. So you you took a, a stab at it, and I thank you. And it's it, it's one of those where we have to kind of take a look and see how these pieces fit, fit together. And I will I will answer that question during or or a little bit more of, of what you were talking about in in this lecture series. Miranda, thank you, Amitofa. Amitofa, my interpretation of the mind is what I detect at this moment, uh, what I detect through my eyes, my ears, my senses, and what I am interpreting up here or what my perception is. That's how I see my mind. Um, it needs a lot of cleaning up. It needs some sort of maintenance. And I think it's an ongoing process, an ongoing exercise. To me, meditating is happening every moment. I sleep, I go to the bathroom, I eat, I work. That's my definition. Thank you. If the Buddha was here, he would say, Ananda, is that you? <laughs> so review the Shurangama Sutra. And, uh, and there's too many mys and eyes in that. Uh, but that's natural because this is our, our confusion, our, our, our basic fundamental ignorance of, of tying everything to a life and being and doing things. Chan does not sit, say, oh, Miranda, you cannot do any of those things. It says you can do them without obstructions, without uh, saying this is um, good tasting toothpaste or bad tasting toothpaste. Um, it is, um, looks at you and says, okay, well, there's a, an, an extra wrinkle. I don't see it, but maybe there might be. And you look in the mirror and you see there's an extra wrinkle, but that's natural. You're not going to go backwards and look like a baby. You know, we get older. 
And um, so it sees things just as it is, including the idea or the, the identity of a self, a personality or an ego. But all of that that's engaged in all of that is not Miranda, but mind. And when we see it in this way, Miranda is just another appearance within mind. So when we sit to meditate, all we're doing is allowing mind just to come back together again, to click. And the appearances within it, it is seen clearly. But all of those, there's no confusion as to who is seen. So who is seen? Anybody? I just gave you the answer. Mind is seen. Mind. Mind. I'm reading a little because I went to your retreat. <laughs> Yeah, mine. So, so that's fine. And we'll have a q and in a while. I just wanted to kind of give these as a start um, in terms of this to try to get you to, to reorient the manner in which one looks at things in terms of how to, to meditate, because this is really important. If you can turn the mind's eye inward, then everything will be perfectly in its place. Our problem is, is because when we look at things, we cling to the things that the ancients said, the horns of a hare or the hair of a tortoise. I don't know if you've ever heard that term before, but it's saying the, these are not real. Or that one sees stars in the sky. What, what are these stars coming from the sky on a let's say in daylight, because it's cataracts. There's cataracts in the eye that make it appear as if there's these wonderful stars all over. Shifu used to say, because he had this condition in, in his eyes called floaters. I don't know if you've ever um, uh, heard about floaters, but I too have um, some floaters, I guess I'm getting long in the tooth or no tooth or whatever but you start getting these little black dots that float along like that. And they, they, and Shifu would say, and they look like bugs, like mosquitoes, little mosquitoes. And he would go like this with his hands, like, get out, get out, get out, get, get out these, these, these floaters. But what he was doing was mimicking our behavior that how many floaters are we chasing after all the time? All of these, these mosquitoes or little bugs, flies like a gnat that we, we, we are chasing, trying to push them away. And he's saying, but they're not real. They're not real. They're just in, in the eye, but it doesn't really affect the sight. So he's talking about the true sight, the sight from mind. This is the sight that we should see, not from this filtered ego uh, uh, vision, which colors everything. But when we sit there in meditation and we're not um, uh, confused about what is appearing, we can really do meditation. But when we're confused about what is appearing in mind, we have no chance. The reason for our confusion comes from, we do not know how mind works. We do not know right view. And as a result, we get frustrated. We really get frustrated that we cannot do it. We are never gonna be able to do it. Not the ego or the personality or a life and being. That's an illusion. It's a castle in the sky. It has no foundation. Truly, in reality, other than it is a brief appearance. And, uh, and duration in the samsaric world. Think about, about all of the great empires that came and they went, oh, this empire will last for, for how many years and how many dynasties from the Egyptians to the Chinese. Uh, to the Ottoman Empire, you, you name it, so many different empires um, that uh, were around, and poof, they're gone. Mind 
has always been there. Mind is clear. But those appearances due to uh, attachments to aversions and vexations and discriminations and desires, they are constantly changing. When we let go of that, and we see what is this, this, this true creator, to know all the Buddhas of the past, present, and future, perceive that all Dharma Dharu nature is created by the mind. Everything created by the mind, not by you. Even if you were to compose a wonderful poem or, or music or a painting, it's still all created by the mind in accordance with causes and conditions. If I was to sing you a wonderful song, it would not sound very good because I don't have a very good singing voice due to causes and conditions. I didn't start with a naturally beautiful voice nor cultivated the practice of it. So it will come out in accordance with causes and conditions. I know that. I have certain abilities and I try to utilize those abilities to, to help others. And this is the part that's very, very important for us that we, we see in this way. Yesterday, I kind of chastised one of my students because a, a, a more beginning student had come up and said that um, he had a, a very good question, a very, very good one. And my student, more senior student, put a, a like on it. Like, I, I, I like what you, your question was. And I said, what are you doing liking his question? You should be answering his question. Why didn't you answer his question? Don't say, oh, this is a good question. What if you guys afterwards, you, uh, after you finish this lecture and then you ask me a question, you go, oh, I like that question. And well, I like it. No, we have to follow function. So, so we have to see the opportunities. We, we're clear about this. We understand. It's not so easy for us to understand well, how are we saving sentient be beings of an illusory nature? Yes. Huh? It's okay. Little by little, that truth will be self-evident in the self-nature of mind. I'm getting a little bit away from meditation, but not so much because all of this has to go in to meditation. I'm assuming that you know how to cross your legs. If anybody doesn't know how to cross your legs, just ask right now and, and I will show you how to cross your legs. But you know that. You know how to put your, your hands together. I don't need to show you that, right? I will show you a little bit about the method as time permits later. But this is the important part to know how we're going to be doing this. We're talking about right view and the components of it, what makes it right view. The first um, component, well, let me throw it out and see if anybody knows any basics of right view. What would you say if you're going to tell somebody about right view, what would you tell them? Anybody? Now's your chance to become, to, to go to the head of the class. I, I can see so many willing participants. Yes, Lewis. There you um, go. A view with compassion at the heart. Okay, and then how does that arise, this compassion? We have to remember, you, it doesn't just appear. How does compassion arise? Uh, Otherwise, it's just worldly compassion. Through wisdom. Through wisdom, okay. And anybody know what kind of special wisdom that produces this very special compassion? It's a very, I'll give you a hint. It's a very long Sanskrit word that you read it all the time. 
Nobody? A teacher sama papa. Courses education never fail. Yo niso. Pratika samapada is part of it. Causes and condition never fail is certainly right view. The wisdom that I'm talking about is anyatara samyak sambodhi. This perfected wisdom, this highest wisdom, which is attuned with pratika samapada, which is also part of right view. When we see things in this way, we have what is, is called just this mind, which is ekayana. So our practice is one of the single vehicle. And this is how we look at it. And um, in the Madhyamika school, they have the two truths of apparent reality and absolute reality. They are not, they are not two. And even we could say they're not one because in ekayana, there is nothing to even be called one. But we use it for expeditious purposes to distinguish it from from uh, um, inadequate doctrines or false doctrines. But when we use this, this ekayana, I'm going to show you how it fits in meditation. You're there and you're meditating and all this stuff is happening. Hold on. And that is one mind. On one side, we have the, the knowing mind and, and the other, we have the Dharmakaya, the appearance where everything is appearing, the mind ground. But this knowing aspect of mind over here is seeing it, but nevertheless, it's one mind. When we see things as just one mind, then when we meditate, we do not create a duality of subject and object with that which is appearing there, we have this, this um, meditation, this method that we're, we're on. And there is a blend, a harmony that accepts all that's appearing there, including vexatious thoughts or scattered thoughts that are arising around the periphery of the, the object of meditation. The object of meditation is simply a placeholder. That's all it does. It's a bookmark. You just keep it there so that you can compare it to something else. So if you're there and you have the method and then something comes up, Oh, those are beads. Those are pretty beads. No, back to the method. And this will come back. He said, they were pretty. No, back to the method. Because it wants to come back in. Let it go. Let it go. And as it does, there's so many things that come up. And, and you're just watching the method. You are aware of that simply because you're not there. Gilbert's not there. Mind is there. Mind is using its awareness to see what's manifesting on the mind ground. How could it not? How could it not see these things? But if you're Gilbert and you would be looking like this at all the stuff that's coming up, you cannot follow it and you get frustrated and you lose the method. But if you simply sit there with the right view, understanding causes and conditions, ekayana, just this one mind, there is not the false mind, even if it's illusory, it's appearing in mind, created by mind. So you don't have to push it off. Where are you going to push the thought to? Really, where, where would you push the thought to? Where would it go? It's maybe outside of the consciousness, but it's still in the mind ground. It's still there. And if you chance to look at it and it comes up, it'll come back again. And if it comes up and it goes, wow, that looks like a skinny donut. Did you say donut? And then it's gonna come back with more force. I want, I want, I want. So it comes up and the I want comes up. Don't disregard these non-form mental impressions. I hate, 
I love, I want, they too come up and they append themselves to something. So it's there. So if I drink my coffee, this is my shameless coffee break time. <laughs> and then my mind says, wouldn't that have tasted better with a donut? Oh my God, the donut comes back again. But when you're practicing and you just rest the mind, it will work. Now, here's the important part of this, parts that are not taught, but should be taught in terms of meditation. And that's that when we sit, even before we sit, we have the mind of mind, not the mind of Gilbert, but we are already in mind. And as we sit to preparing ourselves for meditation, mind is just there simply and perfectly there, perfectly just sitting. In that moment, as you're bringing up your method, it's yours to lose. You do not start from the idea of, I want to, I want to, I want I'm going to sit, I'm going to meditate, and I'm going to, to sit until I see mine. What the heck do you think you're using right now? Wake up, wake up. You're using mine. You're not using your ego. Your ego can't see anything. It's part of the problem. It cannot produce anything. It thinks it produces. It thinks it brushes its teeth and goes to work or whatever, but it's all created by the mind in accordance with Pratika Samapada. There is no individual life and being that's there. But that's scary. That's scary. I, 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 I want everything to disappear, but I don't want to disappear. I have fear. No, that's ignorance, ignorance. And it's ignorance not to teach this from the very beginning, not to say to you and say, you know, uh, Robert, you've been uh, really sincerely practicing with me for all this time. I'm going to give you a secret. What is it? The parrot is an illusion. You are an illusion but you use the Buddha mind. Wow. How come you didn't tell me that before? It would have been much easier. Quite so, quite so. This is the shortcut to meditation. The shortcut. You don't have to put in all of those long hours going, ring the bell, ring the bell, ring the bell. Pain, pain, pain. Of course, that will still happen. The only difference is you know that that suffering is non-existent it's impermanent. And it, it alleviates the suffering, maybe not the pain, but you see the world as it is, as it appearing, simply in accordance with Pratika Samapada. This is very, very important. And, okay, pay attention, because this is important too. This is something I tell everybody when they med begin to meditate in, in um when I'm doing teaching on meditation, if you meditate, then let's see what time. If you meditate, you are um, and you meditate well. The next time you sit, you're going to meditate well. But if you meditate and you only can hold the method for five minutes before all the scattered thoughts take you away and the only way they can take you away is if you're an illusion they cannot take mind away how could they even have power to to take mind away they only can occlude mind then next time when you sit you will sit for five minutes and then you will have 25 minutes of free flow of all these habitual tendencies and they'll be out of control and by and large that's the way most people Meditate and every, every once in a while, they get to the point where 
where everything locks in and then they go, I can't feel my body. Where's that wonderful light coming from? And then they get all excited. Wait till I tell Gilbert about this one. And um, hold on a second. Uh, see if I can find something. Um, somebody sent me something today about, see if I can, uh, maybe not. I'll do it for next week. Um, but, but in any case, I might get it here. Somebody sent me this. I don't know if you're going to be able to see it or not. Oh. Hold on. Oh. It's floating on me. But it's a, a, a woman that's saying, my students don't say can't, they say not yet. And so, so that's the way it is with you that you should not say, I can't do it. You should say, not yet, not yet. And if you come to me and then you're telling me about all these wonderful things that happened to you, I'll say, not yet. Those are the most kindest words I could possibly tell you is not yet. Because by telling you that, then what happens is that you, you don't have this kind of a feeling that you have uh, achieved anything. If you have the feeling that you've achieved anything, then it, it's not quite right. I remember when Shifuhi had conferred upon me Inca, uh, Inca's um, kind of a, a little bit of an indication of, of your experiences. But my only thought at that time was, this is going to change my life. And I will definitely be doing a lot more instructing. And, and there's things that will happen, which is true, it would happen. But I didn't think, wow, I got this golden ticket. Um, it's not that way. And, and I think that's why Shifu would, would confer that on me because he knew that the reaction it would be was more of a responsibility than some kind of an allocate or some kind of a, of, uh, of a reward. It's more of the, the seriousness of, of what's happening. And so this is, um, this is the way we look at the practice. We're not trying to grab anything. What we do is we start when we meditate and we, we meditate with the right view, with mind, right from the beginning. It's ours to lose. We already are using mind. We don't have to get anywhere. We don't have to see anything. We just have to maintain the mind in the present moment, not trying to push off thoughts, but clearly illuminating the mind so that the mind is aware of what is arising within it. The ancient masters said, the crime is not that thoughts arise in the mind. And this is true because the thoughts are, arise in the mind naturally. We put them there. So we understand in accordance with Pratika Samapada that these thoughts will be generated. He, but they say, it is the crime is in not being aware that they have arisen. This is where we fall down. When we sit to meditate and we're on the method all of those appearing thoughts are such wonderful practice vehicles because we can just let them float by like clouds. So wonderful, the mind is free. It's in a state of equanimity. It sees essentially how it's working, how all of these illusory thoughts are rising and rising and rising. We let them go. We just stay part with the method. I choose the Buddha in the present moment. I choose this way. And so when we do that, but if something comes up in mind, let's say 
the donut and it starts taking you away, then you missed it. You missed when it arose. And, and so then it has a chance to take you away. It keeps going. Here's your method right here. And it just, after a while, this is all you see. So when we see a thought arising in mind, irregardless of where it's coming in from, we are aware of it. We shine the illumination of the awareness of our self nature on this. And what's wonderful is if something comes in from the other side, it too is instantaneously aware because it's not linear thinking that I see this and I see this. The mind can handle many appearances at one time because it's in a state of equanimity. And this state of equanimity is aware of all of these appearances in the very moment when they start coming into the periphery of our consciousness, they're illuminated. And because they're illuminated, as they're coming into the periphery of, of, of the mind, as they're illuminated, then they slowly go away. Because if you give it thought, if you look towards it, then it, it will come and take center stage in mind. And these guys over here will come and say, we're next, we're next, we're coming in, we're coming in. Method is gone. But if you do not directly look at these, but understand that they are appearing, by their own nature, they will dissipate. So when you meditate, you understand how this works. The only thing is, is that you have to look at the things, this method continuously. If you do not look at it continuously, it leaves gaps in which things can come in. If all of a sudden you go, and then boom, here comes the thoughts. And then you lose your place. You lost your bookmark, which is your method. Shifu said the method will protect you. Hold the method, hold the method. He means continuously hold the method. Don't let anything come. If you practice like this, I guarantee you that you're going to, to have not just one good sitting, but every sitting is going to be good. Because every sitting you start as if you're going to uh, a casino with a big stack of chips this high and it's yours to lose. If you stay with the method, more chip, more chip, more chip. If you start looking at all of the things that are rising in mind, the stack gets lower and lower until finally you lose all of the, um, the, your chips and you're off the method. But the good thing is that you can just go, okay, fine. I start again, reboot everything. Systems are on, present moment, method, awareness, concentrating on the method. Now you're back. All the chips come up again, and it's yours to lose. So you don't start from the point of view of sitting there meth and going, what are you doing? I'm waiting. I'm waiting to become enlightened. Uh, if I keep my legs crossed like this, I might have a chance to get in, in, enlightened. No, that's not the way to do it. What are you going to gain? Anybody know what you're going to gain by sitting in this way? Besides a flat bottom. Anybody? Nothing. What can Gilbert gain? Gilbert is a name, but this very mind is utilizing him to communicate with you from the heart. We talked about the compassion. This is the key. So this is the way in which we work with things. I think my time is up for today, um, but we'll continue on. There's no beginning or end to this lecture. It is just this free flow to help you get a feeling for how to meditate. And I think you have a better idea 
of that now, remembering that when you start, you're starting with already this very, very mind. There's no need to seek for it. As Master Ling Chi said, you don't cut off your head and then you look for it. You put the head, your head back where it should be and you meditate. And, and then you compare. No, as you're sitting there, if thoughts are coming in and they're taking you away, you know you've lost this wonderful essence of mind that was there maybe only for five seconds or five minutes or 20 minutes. If you get to 20 minutes, it's going to stay. It's going to want to stay because it is liberated. It feels free. And you'll know that feeling of freedom. Who's a free? Freedom from Gilbert. My gosh, he's such a troublesome fellow all the time. Talking, talking, talking. You know, has an opinion on everything. An insatiable quest for finding every single donut on earth. And so we don't want him to be in control. Well, mine. This mind that, that touches all of you, every single one of you, this sincere interest in your well-being is so much more valuable than even a whole planet made out of donuts. I'll up the ante and say a whole cosmos made out of donuts. <laughs> it's such a precious thing. It's liberating to seek the liberation of others. This is the true essence of meditation. Okay, any questions for today? Uh, so now we'll open up the forum. Please click, click the uh, hand button or you can post question on the chat. We have about 15 minutes, so please use every opportunity to ask questions. And oh no, that was you. And nobody has any questions. You guys understood this. This is a um, a kind of a. Hopefully, can you hear me? All right, my my thing was saying I was unstable. All right. We can hear. Um, okay. Um, in the next uh, couple of lectures, we'll add more meat onto it, but I just wanted to give you the essence today so you can begin to practice. A any confusions with what I was saying? Uh, Hassan has a question. Hassan, please, uh, you can unmute yourself. Diana, I think you saw from you that time I was not careful about it, but later I, I later I understood that what you're talking is the essence of the meditation. Wait, you're moving move closer to your microphone. I'm it's sorry. It's hard to hear you. I'm sorry. Good job, Nathan. Uh, the thing is, the, you uh, in your recent uh, sessions, I heard the Ekayana concept from you. But they, that time I didn't take it very seriously. But now I understand that this Ekayana thing is the essence of the meditation. That's why we sit on too much pain. That's why we suffer. But I forgot my question. So you were saying Diana? What? Were you using the word Diana? No, Ekayana. Oh, Ekayana. Ekayana. Oh, Ekayana. Okay. All right. That makes a, a more sense. I couldn't hear, hear you a little bit muffled. But it is this way, as you begin to process this, I seem, then contemplate on this. This is because this sticks to you in terms of it. And, and that particular uh, understanding is what we call a turning uh, phrase that all of a sudden it means something to you and it, it will begin to to um, you'll be able to to um, let's say harvest some wisdom out of that. So you use that as a way of, of trying to uh, find out what how how this applies, and it will make it will it will lead you to to greater wisdom. 
I'm not sure if I answered your question, though. Actually, I remember my question. Uh, is there a, is there a thought that we can read and have a deeper idea about Ikeana? Okay, can you just speak yeah. up a little louder and, and well, say it? Okay, let me come in. I said, yeah, come is in. There a, is there a thought that we can read about Ikeana? There's many books. What I would suggest you do is start with Google, and then you can even start with something like a Wikipedia, and then and read about Ekayana from there. And then if you go down, and you'll see uh, source material, and you can pull it from there. But that way, you you get um, a very um, diverse. Uh, kind of an experience from it from different people interpreting Nekayana is probably the best way. You will see that in the sutras as well, well where they will talk about it, you know, an exact point and verse I, I, I could not give to you, but this is how you start, but it may reference a sutra or something, and then you look or somebody's writing, and you'll see it all the time, especially in Mahayana um, writing, you'll see this this idea of of Ekayana because it's so um, uh, doctrinally pivotal to to everything um, as like Shifu kind of analogized it to this mind that's like this and then there's spokes that go out and all the spokes are the Dharma but but this hub is the vital aspect of it and and so as you begin to practice that you'll begin to kind of see how it fits together and it will make sense of, of the sutras as well. So I, I do encourage you to, to, to look into that further, okay? Yeah. So thank you for your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Anybody else? So no one else? I know that uh, Santa had put up some something um it just showed up briefly do you want to say anything about that oh you know, i was just echoing something um you had mentioned that towards the very end that was very touching um to seek the liberation of others um let me let me go back and say that that, that it is liberating to seek the liberation of others that yeah. was uh, that was so precious thank you yeah, Gilbert thought that was pretty good too when it came out because I <laughs> I don't know where the heck that came out from, but it just came out, and it's just kind of one of those things that flows out. and And I thought that's it. I mean, we we go to the essence of of this practice, and obviously, this is a kind of a a, a very let's say more profound or deep statement that's made that some people can pick up. And they understand it not from the intellect, but from the heart. And when you when you see a statement like that, because I saw that, and I went, "That's that's good. That's that because it it really exemplifies what mind is, what this ekayana mind is. It, it it clearly sees is is in this way this this interest in the suffering of others, and and to to do that is the liberation of the saints." as they call it, because one is a saint being the bodhisattva is is this this tireless practice of of seeking the liberation of others so uh it is something kind of a, a um a, a wonderful kind of a statement anything else esther uh, has a question all right esther yes uh hi Gerard. uh my question is uh for obeka would you please kindly elaborate on this um, when we are applying method to meditation? What was the first word you said for what? It was, is it Ubeka? Ubeka? Uh, equanimity, Ubeka? Yeah, yes. Oh, oh she's, speaking, she's speaking in, in, in Sanskrit. Upika, yeah. Upika, yeah. Well, that's the way I say it. You may, what, how, how is it said, Santa? Do you know? Um, it's upeka in uh, Pali and up, up, uh, upeksha in uh, Sanskrit. 
Upecha. Upecha in Sanskrit, but Upeka in in uh, in Pali. Es, es pronounce it just right. And and I I use the Western stylized version of Upika the way it sounds as it's spelled. So thank you very much um, for that. And so uh, can you say your your question again? I'm sorry. I, I would like uh, you to um, elaborate on this. How, how do we apply, I mean, with regards to um, the, the method? I'm not sure whether I got it uh, right. So I just want to make sure. Essentially, what it does is, is that it places everything um, on equal ground so that the mind is not titillated by the arising appearances or angered or any emotion arises. Any emotion or titillation of the senses to any kind of an arising um, 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 experience in the mind ground, let's say that in your environment, whether it's mentally or externally, um, will, will cause an instability in your meditation. When you, when you have this uh, uh, opicca, uh, it is the state of equanimity or equipoise, what happens is, is that the mind is very, very, very calm. And so if it hears a car go by or a motorcycle or uh, whatever it is, it, it, it just allows those sounds to dissipate without following them. Um, and so, of course, let's say if you were a mother and you had a child and you were meditating and the child was in the crib and it was crying, of course, that's a different thing. It would, it would be aware of that, aware of your function and would be able to tend to that child or elderly person or whatever to interrupt the meditation for something that's, that's uh, immediate. It wouldn't just block everything out. It is not a comatose state. It's a state of heightened awareness the heightened awareness can only come from the state of equipoise where everything is seen, but is not judged or graded as to uh, levels of, of importance as it applies to a personality, ego or life and being. It is, it is seen as a level of importance to the function of mind only, which is different it, in this way that function of mind is untainted and it follows wisdom as to what's there. Your question is a very, very good one, you know, and um, maybe next week I'll, I'll expand on it because it's, it's critical in terms of, let's say a high level of meditation to this is right view to understand how one uses this, this uh, equipoise to keep the mind simply in the present moment, looking at the method. And, and, and so all of these things that are appearing are just seen equally and, and they, they will dissipate because they carry no present function. If one has a money problem, a boyfriend, girlfriend problem, a wife problem, a husband problem, all of these things, they come in naturally, they're gonna appear when you're meditating. You cannot block them, nor should you block them. They're going to appear, but in a state of upika, then all of those things are essentially just flow by because they don't serve the present function of meditation. A lot of times people say, and I know who you are, and and they'll say, oh, I sat there in meditation. And I worked out all my problems. And no, meditation is not for working out your problems. If you want to do that, sit down and work out your problems. But don't work them out when you're meditating. Shufu once had one of his advanced students say, oh, I was doing the Shikantaza method. And I could see inside my body. And I had a problem here and here and here and here and here. And Shufu stopped them right away, because especially he was a senior student. And he said, he said, that's not meditation. He says, if you're sick, go to the doctor. No, otherwise, just go back to meditating. And he was being very strict in terms of what meditation is. And it's important because this was not upika. He was not in a state of equipoise. He was a state of self-indulgence. And 
And so this is not meditation. Meditation there is shown by the absence of adhering to any kind of a self. You're simply mind looking at mind and whatever is appearing on it, including those notions of self are seen in the mind ground. They are not that which sees. That's why I said, it's very important. I will show you not how to meditate, but how to see. It's very, very important. If you do that, when you get up off your cushion, now you can see, wow, I can see, I can see this person is this way. This person does this because of this, this is going to happen. This is ha what happened in the past. You can see all those things. It's wonderful. Why would you not want to do that? Free. I, I give it to you free and willingly so you can pass to other people. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Do we have any more time? No. I think we're about time for today. Um, so if there's no more questions, uh, we okay. will end today's talk. Uh, please join Palm. So can you uh, lead us to transfer merit? To all of those who are suffering in this world or to be suffering, to all those who have suffered and we pass this merit to them so that their suffering from the past, present and the future will be alleviated. And that we give this wisdom to all who are hearing to understand how this works so that you may continue on your path of liberation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Gilbert. You're welcome, you're welcome. Thank you, Gilbert. Thank you, Gilbert. You're welcome. Practice. Thank you. <laughs>